Hello, everyone. My name is Angie Peacock. I'm a psychiatric withdrawal consultant and a healing coach for people that are coming off meds. Um, if you're watching on YouTube later, would you do me a huge favor? Please just hit subscribe. It helps move the algorithm. That's how things work nowadays. Um, but anyway, today we are speaking with Helen Clark. And I have to tell you about Helen. I would not have gotten through college without Helen because yeah, my brain right. was so scrambled eggs. Yes. Me and Helen have been friends our entire withdrawal experience. How long have we known each other? Like, oh my do we goodness. Know? Maybe like five. It, it's got to be at least, at least five, five years. Five years. At least. We've met in person at least twice. More like four. <laughs> really? I see. I can't even remember. It's all a blur now. Anyway, so Helen is an English professor and she, I used to, she used to help me edit my papers. Like I would write them out. I would sleep on it. I would try to write it again the next day. And then I would say, Helen, help. Can you please read my paper? Because my brain is scrambled eggs. And she would help me write my, you know, she didn't write it for me. She just made sure it wasn't like, it made sense. <laughs> so I could not have gotten through college without you. My, my entrance X essay, I remember that. And you've always like been a cheerleader and just said, Angie, you write beautifully. It's fine. You're good. You know, you just do the little corrections in between. But I just remember those early days of withdrawal. Like I could, I was just stare at the paper. Like, what does this even say? I don't understand English, you know? So thank you for that. Thank you so much for that. Well, you are such a wonderful writer. And so it's always a pleasure to help you with your writing because you. you have a really wonderful voice and your writing is always fine. You know, you just needed, we all need an editor. You know, we all do like, we all need some, but another set of eyes to look at our work. That's true. So. Well, thank you. So Helen wrote this book, stepping toward freedom. And she actually gave me a signed copy. It's so beautiful. She wrote, Angie, what an honor to know you and be your friend. Healing is real. Don't stop fighting. Love Helen. That makes mm -hmm. me want to cry. Anyway, I, when she gave me this book, I could not read it because I was just so in withdrawal. I could not concentrate. I'd have to close one of my eyes to read. It was really bad. So I wanted to circle back when I actually could read. And I read the entire book finally, which shows my evidence of healing. And it's just such a good book. I, I, I feel like this is the best kept secret of the Benzo community because you guys don't know about this book and I want you to go get it. I don't get anything for it. I mean, H Helen, I'm just saying it's like a manual to how to get through this experience uh -huh. really is. So let me read her bio really quick. And then we're going to jump right into questions, but we're going to talk about the book. We're going to talk about her healing process and just like the intersection of friendship and healing and what to do and how to cope. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going today. So Helen Clark, M-A-E-D, is an English professor, author, and editor who lives in the Washington, D.C. area. After taking clonazepam exactly as prescribed, she endured a 27-month battle tapering the medication and recovering from benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction, also known as BIND. Helen wrote the book, Stepping Toward Freedom, Affirmations for Healing and Benzo Withdrawal to provide a hopeful, supportive toolbox for those coping with the nonlinear and distressing symptoms of BIND. The book can be found at the link that will be provided in the comments. Uh, Jill is in the audience today, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them, but I probably get to most of them. All right. So Helen, can you talk about why did you get put on a Benzo? What happened? What led up to it? And yeah. just a little... Yeah, about absolutely. How. So I've taken notes because I'm not as good at talking extemporaneously as you are, Angie. You're so good at it. I'm Thank not. You. <laughs> but and you know, all of us who have gone through this horrible uh life stripping experience, it's so circuitous, right? Because so many of us are like, what is happening to me? And trying to find a doctor who will help us. So that's why I kind of wanted to take notes because it's like there are so many like little sidebars and sidetracks that I could go on. Sorry, that's yeah. my landline. I st okay. I'm an old okay. I still have a landline. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. I think it's cool. Okay. Anyway, so um, in 2012, this horrible trauma happened in my family. It was just awful. And, you know, honestly, anybody would have PTSD after that. You know, it was just like, and you and I have talked about this a lot, that yes, it's post-traumatic stress. It's not even a disorder. It's just like a normal human animal reacting to a prolonged stressful experience, you know? Yes. And um, anyway, so I was having like panic attacks and a lot of anxiety. I wasn't sleeping. And like, I, I've always had trouble sleeping. Um, mm -hmm. That was kind of like my underlying condition was just the insomnia just, of course, makes everything worse, right? Yes. And, um, I, you know, I was very vulnerable because I, you know, I was going through this 
ongoing stressor that was so horrible that my whole family was going through really it was awful and um you know, I was very vulnerable. So honestly, I would have tried anything at that point. And I think that's like an important message I want to like get across to people is like, you're so vulnerable when you're not sleeping, when you're going through a horrible trauma, when you're having awful, you know, you're in a dis and you're, you're in distress. Mm -hmm. So honestly, like I would have like probably taken anything at that point, which was, that was really my fault that I didn't research these drugs more carefully. Anyway, my uh, general practitioner said, you really need to go see a psychiatrist. And, you know, back then I had just respect for shrinks. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I went to one and uh, he just very like cavalierly put me on clonazepam, like no warning. I didn't even know it was the generic of clonopin. And so, you know, I took it and yes, it did help me sleep because these drugs are like it's like, honestly, like shooting a sparrow with a cannon. You know what I mean? Like they're so heavy duty. And I didn't know that like one milligram of clonazepam is equal to 20 of Valium. You know, I, you learn all these things later, right? Yeah. When you're like up shit's Creek without a paddle and you're like, <laughs> what the hell is happening? But yeah. I didn't know. So, you know, of course it helped me sleep. But then it didn't really, you know, then of course it didn't really work that great after you know, like I was on it for like seven months before all hell broke loose. And I get this letter from the psychiatrist saying, you know, we're can't, you know, we're not taking your insurance anymore. I'll give you a one month refill. Oh my gosh. So of course, not knowing that how, what these drugs are really like, I was like, well, I guess I better find another doctor that can prescribe me something to help me sleep. Cause you know, I'll never learn how to sleep without drugs. This was, this was like the thought that went through my mind. This was, mm -hmm. I had convinced myself that I needed a drug to sleep and now I don't take anything and I sleep, you know, yeah, not great some nights, but I mean, I'm getting, well, is it, is it fair to say maybe the drug was actually interrupting your sleep or not letting you sleep naturally? Do you think it was of really course. helping? I yeah. mean, we know now, like after researching this, I'm like, the most effective thing for insomnia is like, is, you know, um, cognitive behavioral techniques. But so why are these doctors prescribing these strong mm -hmm. sedatives like candy? If, because you know what, because it's like the magic bullet, we all want like instant gratification, you know? And of course it's hard to teach yourself how to sleep and to just relax and endure some sleepless nights while you're learning how to sleep. So that was my big underlying issue. Um, so anyway, so I started, you know, of course I started like cutting down on the clonazepam because I had one month left. And of course we know what happens. It's like, puts you in a cold Turkey situation. Mm -hmm. Not everyone. I feel like I need to say this. Yeah. Yeah. The little disclaimer. disclaimer. Some people metabolize these drugs. Okay. But there's a big chunk a huge percentage of people that don't. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was in like really like hurting for certain. I mean, it was, you know how it is. It's just oh, yeah. was like, like, what is this? Like air hunger and just like, extreme anxiety and, you know, like agoraphobia, which I had never had in my life. Mm -hmm. And you know how it is, just those oh, horrible yeah. symptoms. So I basically went from like doctor to doctor trying to find someone who would safely taper me off this drug. And that was like something that I can't even really talk about. I mean, it was like so barbaric. I, I went to like two different psychiatrists after the original psychiatrist who didn't take my insurance anymore. And they were just, it was like gaslighting central, you know, like, well, that's not a symptom of benzodiazepine withdrawal. We, we taper them off. We taper people off in two weeks. And I was like, well, this is real. I'm not making this shit up, you know? Like, like, how could I even make this up? Like, why would I do that? Like, right, right. No and, wants you, to be this and they were probably, they were probably thinking you're drug, you're drug seeking, you're doctor shopping. Like you just want more. You must be an addict because this isn't a thing. You know, there's all these things that they say. Yeah. Right. Well, one of them, he was, he was so horrible. I won't even tell you everything because I'll start crying. It was so yeah. traumatic, but he no. was like, 
he was just salivating to like put me on more medications and like put all these like labels on me. And I was like, nah, like, I just knew like, no, like I want help getting off of this drug, but I want to do it in a safe and humane way. Right. And then um, the second one, yeah, she accused me of being an addict. She stuck her finger in my face and was like, you're addicted like that. And I like chased her down the hall into her office. And I was like, your profession did this to me. Like, yeah, I, I'm not trying, I'm not a drug seeker. I've never, like, I'm just trying to safely taper this right. drug so that I don't die. And by well, the I, way, like people can die from cold turkey, yeah. cold turkey. And they're just so ignorant. Like, I just was like amazed at how ignorant the whole medical profession was about this. It was like, it's like being in like a sci-fi movie where like, you're the only one that like is sane and everybody else around <laughs> you is telling you these lies and you're like running through the corridors, like, help me out of here, you know? And like, we can laugh about it now, Angie. And I yeah, know like, it was not funny at the time. No, it's not funny. And I'm, you know, it's that dark humor. That's kind of how we bond. Yes. The, the, the pharma harmed, you know, the benzo harm community. We, we use that dark humor, but for those of you out there that are going through this, I know it's not funny at all, but no. looking back on it, it's absurd. You know what I mean? Yes. It's like absurd because you're like, these are the people who are, are supposed to do no harm. And then I finally found a doctor who could help me. He, he has since passed away, but he was wonderful because he'd gone through it himself and he helped me. And I just like, I did a liquid, a very slow liquid taper by, I, I'm horrible at math, but it was like 0.05% a week, but I would hold my taper sometimes for weeks at a time. Cause it was so, it was still so grueling, you know? I'm so glad um, you're, you're talking about this because recently I've had lots of people that are tapering. I have two tapering support groups that meet twice a month. And everybody right. in there is like, I don't know if I'm doing it right. I don't know when to hold. I don't know how slow I'm trying to follow, but I can't. And there's all this, like, I don't know. And I'm always like this, there's no right way to do it. You got to listen to your body and just do it whatever way you got to do it. You know? So I like to right. hear that you listen exactly. to your body as much as possible and just. Right. And time. that's all like, I feel like that's all like people are asking for is like, help me survive this experience. Like, like go as like, my advice is like, go as slow as you need to. Um, I mean, of course you want to, you do want to like eventually be able to oh, exit yeah. these drugs. Cause that's when you really start healing and get your life back. But, but yeah, like go as slow as you need to go. Like, so that it's as humane as possible and you can have as much dignity as possible. Um, mm -hmm. Cause it's hard enough, you know, and yeah, we all want to know like the right thing to do. And the thing is, I, that's why I'm so glad people like you are out there helping people. And, you know, like Heather Ashton, like her whole thing was like, the doctor should be working with the prescriber should be working with the patient and checking in with them as a team so that they go as slow as they need to go to maintain some kind of quality of life. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and like my quality of life there, I mean, it was pretty harrowing, like the whole ordeal, but not as harrowing as going cold turkey. Like, I'll tell you that, right. um, you know, and I was very fortunate that I have this great, amazing husband and amazing daughter, you know, I mean, they're all great. And niece, granddaughter, and wonderful niece. niece. Yeah. Like a lot to Gemma. like a lot to motivate me, right. To like to live a lot to live for because we want to live you know we want to live we want to get our lives back and um so i it, i tapered for like 15 months and then of course I, you know honestly i was one of the lucky ones because as i reduce as i got closer to like finishing my taper um i finished in november of 2016 i um I started to really have windows, you know, like, mm -hmm. and that windows just means like, you feel kind of like yourself, you know, for even like an hour or whatever. And I just remember, like, I was like, I got to be as skinny as a rail and I'm a, I'm a big woman, you know, <laughs> but like, I got so skinny and I was just like, cause you have so much cortisol and everything. And 
I was, I was just really out of it and everything, but I was feeling well enough this one day, Gary and I went to like this pumpkin patch and it felt like a trip to Paris, you know, cause I felt like I'm like living like, and it was like fall and like the pumpkins were so pretty. And, and we got like, you know, little apple ciders, you know, and you would have thought like, I was just going on a, like a trip to Europe, you know, cause I was just like, what is that phenomenon though? Because this week it's come up a couple of times. Like I asked someone who's three and a half years off and I was like, have you had those awe experiences yet? And she's like, oh yes, Angie, I can sit in the grass and I can look at the dew. And it's just like, oh. Like, what is that? Is that because we come out of suffering and you just something like, what is that? I don't know. But I remember like also going to Great Falls one day and I was having one of those experiences, you know, when I was healing and it was like seeing families together and like cry. just seeing the beauty and the rocks and the trees. I was just like awestruck, you know, and I, I think like your GABA starts to come back online and and you're and you just you've been in this like little dark cave, like just sort of trembling in fear, you know, all those months. And then it's like, life really is beautiful. Your brain is really starting to heal. So I'm not really sure what the phenomenon is, but you get like, you get like these highs and you're just like, oh my, you're coming out of like a stupor and you're like, oh my God, life is so beautiful. Why don't people like notice just how amazing it is just to feel comfortable in your body, just to feel like you can enjoy life again you know it's just you know and that's one of those gifts because you asked in one of your questions um like you know I talk about the gifts and the shit storm it's like it's like just the ability to do ordinary things again that we took for granted yeah is like such a gift I just thought about that this morning because I was going to do laundry and I was like wow how times have changed. When I first got on the road, I was really sick. And it was like, it was like going into hell itself just to do laundry. Like, and now it's just like, just throw it in, you know, do your thing, go take a shower. You know, it's nothing. But back then it was like, you're walking through an electrocution. You know, I'm thinking of like a mud pit of just hell. I don't know. And now it's like, everything's easy again. Because the sense, like, because of GABA is like, helps mediate sensory you know stimulation and so like everything when you're GABA deprived because benzodiazepines hijack your GABA and then you have to start making your own GABA again you know you're you're just like a scared like I've heard you say you're like a snail without a shell and and our GABA like all these things our brains do for us just automatically like mediating sensory input mediating Mm -hmm. intrusive thoughts you know it's like I don't want to mess with my brain, you know, like my brain, I want my brain to do its job. And like these drugs just remodel our brains in ways that we don't understand. And and so, yeah, just being able to do ordinary things again is such a blessing Mm -hmm. and such a gift. And we start to sort of take it for granted after you're healed, you know, you're like getting all upset over these. I, I am anyway, over things that (laughs) <laughs> I would have longed for, you know, now that I, you know, I've been working again since 2018. So I, I couldn't work, you know, for about two years after I finished tapering. And then I started working again. I finished tapering November, 2016. I started working again, August, 2018, started teaching again. And I just remember like, just being like, can't do it. I remember you saying, I don't think I could do it. I can't do it. And we we're like, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yeah, well, it's hard. It's really, it's so wonderful to be able to work again. For me, that was really the turning point. And I know for like a lot of folks, that's a real turning point is like being able to work again because mm-hmm. it, and, and, you know, for whatever that means for each person, you know, if, if it means if you're a stay at home mom, if it means like being able to truly be available for your children again and truly be like, going to their games and their dance recitals and being like, I'm really here. I'm not just enduring this because I, for my kids, I'm really enjoying this. You know, I'm really like here. Yeah. And, you know, it's just so wonderful again to be working and being able to 
contribute to our income. I mean, that's a huge thing. I know with like so many of us losing income. Um, it's just like getting your dignity back. It's like the last yes. thing. Like I yes. have to get my dignity back. I have to not. Yeah. I was on disability for 18 years, 18. I know. I know. All this stuff. I know. I know. Okay. It's... Well, let's get on okay. with it. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't, I'm trying not to cry all the time. Okay. 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 <laughs> so can you talk about briefly about your healing process and like, maybe what was it like? How did it go? And then at what point did you decide to write a book about what you were doing, what you were dealing with? So, um, let me just flip to that page. Okay. <laughs> so honestly, like I was able to, I kind of pushed myself, you know, like when I was, I'd, I'd done tapering, I was still very weak. Like it was just hard even walking up and down the stairs because I, you know, I wasn't sleeping. I was very debilitated by the whole experience. Um, and, you know, just those weird symptoms that you have, the weird brain fog and weakness and everything. Mm -hmm. But I was like, just, I really pushed myself, you know, to start, you know, making bead jewelry again. And like a friend and I started an editing business and that was a really great brain exercise for my brain, you know, and then um, just trying to read more sophisticated books again and just trying to engage my brain. And of course, like the 2016 election was going on. So oh, like, no. you know how political I am. I won't, I won't like, no, just leave it. But, but I, it, what was so great about it was it got me reading the newspaper and really exercising my brain. And, and I just really recommend people do that like push yourself a little like exercise your brain because uh, you know if anything it makes the time go by faster you know but I also just believe in that neuroplasticity of like you know and as I get older I mean I'm 65 it's a good practice just to grow old gracefully is like gotta use it you know use it or lose it and so then I started thinking well I really want to write about this experience you know, so I was still recovering when I started and it just sort of started with these little must, mustard seed ideas, you know, just like kind of brainstorming all the aspects of the experience, the insomnia, anxiety, the non-linearity of the symptoms, intrusive thoughts, the importance of distraction, the importance of finding mentors. Just I started writing reflections about all those little things and then like a few affirmations afterward. You know, and the affirmations are not like, you know, I am one with the universe, you know, or no. like, it's not like, you know, um, I forget what it's called, like, like the law of attraction or anything like no, that. No, it's no. not that new age kind of stuff. It's more like, no. how can I survive today? You know, yep. like, so that I can like be here for the beautiful life waiting for me on the other side of this, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I just started writing and then it honestly, like, the book kind of wrote itself and I, I, it didn't really. Cause like, you know how you had to put some writing is hard yeah. work, but I just, it was simple. I wanted to keep it very simple Yeah, because people in Benzo withdrawal don't need to read like Kierkegaard, you know, no. <laughs> they need simple, like, okay. Just like spell it out to me. Practical, yeah. right. Like That's... practical, like what can I do exactly. to distract myself today so that I don't go out of my freaking mind, you know, just exactly. things like that. And, um, it just kind of, and then, you know, I had a lot of help with it. I have this really good friend, Nina, who is a wonderful editor and my daughter like designed the whole book. She's such a wonderful graphic. Gary artist. took the picture on the front. I Yeah, I love it too. Gary took the picture, you know, and, um, you know, it just kind of just came together, you know, mm -hmm. and then I just used a, like a, you know, I self-published it through Lulu. And thank God Colleen helped me format it and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then I included things like um, tips for caregivers and the works cited page and resources in addition to the reflections and the affirmations. And then the introduction has quite a bit of, it's like a synthesis of a lot of the research and of mm -hmm. course, this was published in 2018 and like so much has happened since I was thinking there's, out. there's updates yeah. in the back. Like when I see your resources and the YouTube channels and I'm like, oh my God, there's so much more now than there was back then. So much more. Thank God. Yeah. Like, you know, with 
Benzodiazepine Information Coalition and the Alliance for Benzo Best Practices, the International and Institute of Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, like so many things. So many things. Yeah. And and the new, I love the new nomenclature bind, which is so much more accurate. And the survey that Christy mm -hmm. Huff helped with. Yeah. You know, and it's like much, much more evidence-based research is coming out. The, the FDA has the new black box you know, warning. The yeah. new warning. And so, you know. It's happening slowly but surely, but you just wonder how many new prescriptions are still being written, you know, like, because every day, I mean, yeah, I had somebody yesterday that was on for four months for COVID anxiety, you know, and after it's, four, four months, it's still, oh, he's got two years of withdrawal. Yeah. <sighs> two years. Yeah. It's not good. Oh, yeah, it continues. It continues. It continues. So would you be open to reading a small section? Absolutely. This, but I want you to read the one. All I really need to know, I learned in benzo withdrawal. You got it, girl. I feel like that was my favorite. Yeah. So what page is it on? I wrote page down the 59. number. 59. 59. Okay. Absolutely. I like poetry readings. So this is as close as I can get right oh. now. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So all I really need to know, I learned in benzo withdrawal. The toolbox we develop in benzo withdrawal is invaluable for dealing with the rest of our lives. We have earned our warrior badges in the fire of suffering. I'm going to start crying. I know it's okay. Me too. <laughs> uh, and the lessons are indelibly print, imprinted on us. Some of the lessons, especially those involving our fragility, vulnerability, and mortality are sobering. But those things make the positive lessons even more important. So I'm gonna focus on the positive lessons here. One of the big things I've learned is that I don't need to buy any more stuff. I have more than enough stuff to last a lifetime. The precious people in my life and my precious health are way more important than things. I know I am very fortunate that I still have a roof over my head, food to eat and people who love me. Many, many people in benzo withdrawal lose their homes, jobs, spouses, savings, health insurance, everything. So I am grateful for everything that I have and I try not to feel envious of those who have more. Here are some of the other positive lessons from benzo withdrawal that will stay with me the rest of my life. Appreciate the little things. Love yourself. Laughing is the greatest thing ever. Having a brain that works is a miracle. Being able to sit still and feel comfortable in your own body is a miracle. Every day you are alive and feel relatively healthy is a gift. Don't waste time worrying over stuff you have no control over. Assume good intent. No one is out to get you, and if they are, you don't have time for that. Distract yourself by doing something you enjoy when you are too much in your head. You have become a master of distraction techniques in benzo withdrawal. Strong emotions will not kill you. And this is a huge one, you know, like strong emotions will not kill you. And you, and like, we can survive strong emotions. Beating yourself up over past mistakes does no one any good. Do what you can to make things right and then learn from it and let it go. Nature is incredibly, ridiculously beautiful. Reaching out and helping other people is a beautiful thing. Be proud of every little accomplishment. There was a time in benzo withdrawal when it was a big deal to walk to the mailbox. Don't waste precious time envying others. Be happy for those who are happy. I can no longer afford many extras. So what? I'm so grateful for what I can do. See, there was a time when I couldn't walk to the mailbox above. There is always going to be stuff to deal with. When you have gone through benzo withdrawal, you can pretty much get through anything. If you can't find anything to be grateful for, hold on. There will come a time when you will appreciate many, many things this life altering experience has taught you. You can read the affirmation. Yeah. So these, so that's like a, one of the reflections yeah. and then the, the affirmations go like this. Mm -hmm. Today, I will focus on one good thing that happened to me. This experience will bring into focus what really matters in life. I have faith that I am learning priceless lessons during this experience. What have I already learned in benzo withdrawal? What did I take for granted before? Mm. That's powerful. 
Well, thank you. And when you're in it, it's so hard to see anything. I'm, re I'm reminded the other day, um, we had a group session where someone said, hope is always around you. It's it, You might have to dig for it. You might have to look for it. But when you're like at, at your hopeless moment, it's still even there. You know what I mean? And I yes. think ben Benzo withdrawal de definitely has this way of like stealing any form of hope or faith or just the ability to be a human being and, you know, feel anything normal. 100%. Like you just can't access those that part of you and you just you have to take so much on faith like you feel like you're the only person who's never going to recover everybody feels that way that's like a symptom because the benzo the intrusive thought it's so it's like so severe the suffering but you for to whatever extent one can it's so important to look at those who have healed mm -hmm. and to like reassure yourself that this is a temporary experience and that, you know, most people heal within a year, two years, you know? Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, but you, it's so hard to have access. I know like one of the most painful things is just feeling empathy for others, you know, or feeling connected to God or spirituality or joy or other people you just feel like kind of a slab of meat you know like you're just yeah, suffering you're alive but you're not really alive you know horrible so that brings me to the ptsd question yes um because you and i both have trauma in our history and that's what brought us to psychiatry and asking for help and all the things so how do you think your relationship to that diagnosis has changed through the this process well obviously thanks to people like you, to be honest with you. And, and then you actually gave me Mary Vietin's name, you know, from Warfighter Advance, who helps, you know, veterans, it arms them with information to help them if they want to, you know, taper off psych drugs. And, um, you know, what she said, and what you have said is like, it's not a disorder. It's post-traumatic stress. It's not a disorder, you know, it's a natural, it's, it's that, um, the intensity of being a human being it put into a prolonged stressful situation that feels like a threat. And like, for you, like it was a threat. You were in combat, you know, that is a threat. Like, like a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Bit. So, I mean, um, for me, I mean, I think that diagnosis was very real. Like, I mean, the shrink that I originally saw diagnosed me with general anxiety disorder, which was a total like misdiagnosis. But later on, this therapist that I had seen for a long time, who was wonderful, she she diagnosed me with post-traumatic stress. And I think it was accurate. I mean, my my nervous system was very dysregulated. Um, and then later after I finished tapering, I had EMDR therapy, mm -hmm. which was really very helpful. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's very, um, it's very renowned for helping people. It's very respected. Mm -hmm. And that therapy really did help sort of put the trauma, like from my amyg amygdala or whatever, more into my hippocampus, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is what it, the theory is anyway. Yeah where it's like not front and center. Like I can talk about the trauma. I can, you know, it still makes me very sad, of course, but I can function, you know? And, yeah. um, you know, I, I, the thing about trauma is that even like the veterans administration says that benzos are totally contraindicated for, for trauma because they just re-traumatize you and you don't really process the trauma so, you know, it's, I, I read that sentence in your book. I think it was last night again. And I was like, Oh, like it just, it's always like, oops, sorry, you made a mistake. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. this is 20 years of my life. You, you guys gave me benzos literally a week out of combat situation, one week out and you completely derailed my healing process. I was very angry when I read that. I, I shouldn't be so emotional. I, no, I should be. But when I read that, I was just like reminded, angry. reminded. And right. then one of the other quotes I saw by the VA, because I did a fellowship and that's the last time I saw you in DC. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
but I did this fellowship and I did all this research with VA Veterans Administration and uh, Benzos. And I saw this uh, statistic that said, if you have benzo exposure as a veteran post 9-11 who has deployed, th- that exposure increases your likelihood of suicide 2.4 times. And I was like, oh, anyway, but, it's, you know, it's like such a miracle what you have endured and you're just, you're just incredible. And I'm you. so happy that you're here and doing all the things that you're doing. And but I got through because of people like you, Helen. Well, thank you. I mean, that, that, that's the thing like this Benzo, that's one of the gifts of the shit storm, you know, is that we all found, e- find each other. Yeah. Thanks to the wonders of the internet, like Benzo imagine, recovery groups, <laughs> imagine people having to go through this back well, in the day when there was oh. no internet, but we all find each other. You find your people, you know? And cause I was like, I am not going through this alone. Like I'm just not, you know, and I'm pretty good at like researching and stuff. And I was like, hell, I'm not. And then, you know, meeting you, meeting others. Yeah, I'm let's not let's talk about names, that. But, no, but no, just, no. Let's talk yeah, about it really quick. Yeah. We, there's a group of us. Okay. So what happened was years and years ago, we all met in either probably benzo diazepine recovery group or benzo recovery rated R. I don't know which one, but anyway, there's a group of us ladies. Okay. Three of them live by Helen. So those three had known that they were local and that I'm over here in Missouri. But when I traveled for the film, I went and met up with them. So there's a little group of us. I won't say their names, but one of them is riding her Harley with her husband, like on the back. And this is a person who could not like walk down the steps. Okay. The other one, oh. I'm trying to be as vague as possible. I don't think she'll care though. Cause I'm not going to say her name, but the other one completely She's suicidal, doing great now. take it out of her bed. Now yeah. she's like traveling all over the place on vacation, going to dance things for her kids, yeah. like both of them back to life. Right. And not to say it wasn't easy, but we, I mean, we've had potlucks together. We've laughed, we've cried, we've hugged, we've sent inappropriate memes on Facebook, whatever. Yeah. You know? absolutely. yeah. And that's, and, this and that's why the- I'm so big on healing buddies. I can't, I yes. do it all. I, I literally am like a matchmaker. Like when I hear one woman and Good. I have another one, I'm like, you guys need to talk because you guys are a perfect match. So I'm huge on that. And that's why, because, you know, me and Helen, we got, we all got through this together. You can't not do it by yourself. Absolutely. That's like my number one thing is like, you, you cannot find people. Like I wrote this down. I'm like, find people, like find mentors, find comrades. You know, there's distraction groups on the internet where like, you just post pictures of your walks or you tell jokes or whatever, like what anything all yeah. kinds of you can find mentors and friends for this journey and yeah. you don't have to have like 25 like even just one or two um one one good friend of mine uh in the benzo community she refers to her good friend as her benzo wife you know the two of them <laughs> like just helped each other yeah and and like i've met so many of them like one yeah. really wonderful one like friend that i met through the groups like he stayed at our house and we had just a blast and you know, he was visiting from England and, you know, and then meeting you and our other friends and like, just, yeah, it like the people are so big hearted. Cause it's like, they are, they're huge hearted. Yeah. And they're all going through this experience together and, you know, people need people like, let's, let's face it. And, um, I, I, and, ju- I just feel yeah. like you, you have to heal in community. I don't, it's you almost need like constant reassurance. You need to know that you're not alone. You need a distraction. It's so many things at once. Like the importance of peer to peer mutual aid. That's the word for it. A mutual support, whatever. You're Absolutely. supporting me. I'm supporting you. And like our little group, we weren't all crazy on the same day. You know what I mean? Right, like one day right, I'm crazy, right. and then you know this yeah. person's helping me, and then you just kind of move around, and you know it's a group. And, right. and it's just, the the other thing to say is like sometimes during the process you might grow close to someone, and then you just kind of grow apart and then you find another buddy and that's for another period of time. And then you grow apart and then you find another one for a different period, you know, like as you go. So I totally, I'm a huge fan. This is like, this is a survival game. I mean, Mm -hmm. I like you have to fight. And so like, do, do whatever it takes to find those friends. I mean, and you know, and then like heal, then deal, you know, like you can always like go back and, maybe some friends you might've gotten estranged from during this whole ordeal. You can always try to work things out later, but do what you got to do to like get through it and, and 
heal and taper and get off these damn drugs and Mm -hmm. you know heal your body and um but yeah like it's not something that a person can go through alone and um you know we can survive this but yeah you're right like like that mentor support the peer-to-peer support and I mean I know like you saw you you know you've seen that so vividly in wounded warriors you know how like and only people that have gone through this experience are really going to get it. I know. And that, that, that point is always kind of rubs me because like military veterans will say, I don't want to talk to anybody who's not been there. Like, I don't want to go to a therapist who's never left the United States. What do they know right. about Iraq or Afghanistan? They don't know anything, you know? Right. And, right. and then they always encourage us like, no, it's not about them being there. It's like, they can still understand the feelings of fear and grief and anger and all that. And it's like, it's just not the same. It's just not. No. And that's why I find about the Benzo experience too. That's one of the reasons I do this. Cause I do know. And, and I often reflect, maybe that's why, I mean, not really, but my experience was so severe that that helps me relate to people that are severe because I know how severe it can get. And had I not had that experience, who would I to be to, to help them? Right. I, I totally get what you're saying. Like, I would never say to somebody like it was meant to be, to be. Angie, you know, like you God went through all that. give you what you can it, handle. Yeah. It's like everything happens <laughs> for a reason. I'm like, right. no, but what you've done is you've made meaning out of it. And I think right. that's what we've done. It's like, I, I wouldn't want anyone to have to go through this, but like we made meaning out of it. And it's like, okay, I went through this horrible thing. What can I do to help others others so that they don't have to go through the extent that you went through, you know? Mm -hmm. Or just to give a little bit of encouragement or affirmation or just even people that have, I have some really severe cases right now and just them having a 30 minute appointment every Tuesday at 10 AM keeps them alive. Just like it did for me. And I, I had a guy I talked to for 20 minutes from Wounded Warrior Project that would call me every Tuesday. It was 10 a.m. That's why I said that. And it was like, I just, okay, I'd hang up with them. Okay, I just got to get to next Tuesday. I just got to get to next Tuesday. And that's how I stitched together the time, you know? Yeah. You'd be surprised just how little understanding that we actually need, how little reassurance. And just just seeing someone who's been through it as bad as you and you're sitting on the other side and you're yeah. saying, yeah, I wrote this whole book about it. And yeah, yeah, I got through it and now I can do laundry and not think about it, you know? Exactly. Like it, it seemed, I remember when I was going through it, I would just read success stories, like just like almost just like, you know, just read them just continuously and just like, oh, that's going to be me someday. And I'm not going to be going through this torture, you know, and I'll have my life back True. True. one day. Like, I, and it seemed like this distant fantasy. And, you know, t- like, you know, that one reflection I wrote about time, I just wanted to go into a, time capsule Mm -hmm. but the time does pass and like you do come out of it eventually Mm -hmm. you know um at least you know the the odds are in your favor to really to 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 heal and and um you know and then you it's just like oh my gosh I'm now I can write my success story you know have you written one yet I didn't I haven't either well, I think my yeah. success story is really it's like the book. intro to the book. Yeah, the book is, is my yeah. success story, you know, yeah. that, that, you know, I made it to the other side and um, it's just, it's, it's, it's about time. It's about enduring and the time and, and like. Well, and letting finding, your body do yeah. its job. There was a quote I saw exactly. last week about nature heals without inter with, as long as you don't interfere with it. You know what I mean? Exactly. And I, I found that so profound, like, just leave it alone. It will, it will go. I'm, you know, I'm more of a purist. I didn't do supplements. I didn't do all this stuff. You know, I didn't try H bot and try this and try that. I was too scared to try it, but I really did have like a profound trust. Like I'm taking away the stuff that's hurting me. So let my body fix it. Just leave it alone, you know? And that's what happened, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it takes a lot of faith. Cause again, we're an instant gratification culture. And this is you backwards. Know, we, this is like the opposite wanna, of that. Yeah. yeah. We want to pop a pill, make it all go away and kick. And, but what that does is that you just kick the can down the road. Like eventually say, man, it's gonna your show drugs up. might not work anymore and you're going to have to deal with, or, or they're going to turn on you, you know, at yeah, least I, that's I, what happened for us. 
I, I have a client. He's gonna like that I said this, but I he's he's dealing with insomnia. No more drugs. It's time to to deal with it. You know, there's no more can. Stop kicking. Here it is. Yeah. And he's he, his wife told me like he'll just sit there and go, okay, now we suffer, because that's what I you know that's what I've taught him. It's like that's what Angie says. Now we suffer, because it's like there is no magic way out. It's right. you and your insomnia in bed together and you, it ain't going anywhere. And you're going to wrestle with it for maybe six months or two weeks. I don't know what it is. Everybody's different, but there comes a point when you just have to like, just let it be there. And then it goes away. You're right. And your body, eventually you'll get in tune with sleep and you'll like love sleep again. You're, you'll, you'll mm-hmm. feel that sleep hunger. You'll go to sleep. You'll yeah. dream your sleep architecture has to heal itself. Your sleep architecture is all confused. If you've been mm-hmm. throwing these really strong sedatives at it. And, and I never thought I would be able to sleep. No, me either. Without- I sleep nine hours and I feel That's rested. I don't wonderful. think about it. It's not a dreadful thing. I love my bed. I was telling, who was I talking to last night? I said, she saw me in my bed and I said, I call this the womb, you know, it's just like a gentle place. It's a place I look forward to. I love it. You know, it's like, and before it was like torture, pure torture, trying to sleep. I, yeah, me too. I would just go up to bed and it's like, here's my torture chamber. But now I have the same thing. I love sleeping and um, you know, and if I don't sleep, like I didn't sleep great last night because I was excited, excited about this today. <laughs> you know, it wasn't anxiety. It was, a, and yeah. but I'm, but I'm very calm. You know, I listen to podcasts. I don't stress because it's like this is not life threatening. You know, no, like, not a big like, deal. Invited. And I probably had six hours, which like is a lot Fine. compared to what I was getting before. But because I'm used to getting more, you know, on a good night I'll get seven or eight. So yeah, yeah, it does. It everything heals, and you. But I think we just want that instant gratification because our culture also is like, come on, you got to be productive, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I think it was so devastating when I left my job to just give myself time to heal. Mm -hmm. But I think I just had to do that because, um, you know, it was very scary financially, but I, I just had to just devote myself to just finishing my taper, letting my body heal, learning how to sleep, all those things. And I'm really glad I did. And, you know, that whole like psych drug merry-go-round with the poly drugging and everything else. Try that, try this, try that. Yeah. It's like, thank God. Yeah. We got off the merry-go-round. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, that's my experiences. And I, I know there are some psychiatrists that people are say are good or whatever my experience is that that's the only tool they have in their toolbox Mm -hmm. is giving you a drug Mm -hmm. and um and it's like all these drugs and like you've taught me it's not side effects it's effects (laughs) there's no such thing as a side effect it's an effect drugs have effects right and so (laughs) for me i you know i'm just so glad not to be on taking pain meds or taking psych drugs anymore, you know, anymore. Um, and I just, you know, the, the, the layers just get peeled away where you sort of see like that. Well, I don't, you know, I, I get very nervous that I'm going to, that people it's so pervasive in our society Mm -hmm. that these drugs are, you know, supposedly so safe and so accepted, but I just would, all I want is for people to have informed consent. Like, right. honestly, like I'm not out here trying to pill shame anybody, but no. just make sure that you understand that, you know, read those late, you know, read the insert mm-hmm. <laughs> and understand that like there's compensatory things that will happen in your body. Yep. With these, these drugs that are going to like mess with serotonin and dopamine and all these things. Um, you know, there, there's other things that, other effects that might not be so great and you just kind of have to weigh it for yourself Mm -hmm. um and then of course um the withdrawal profile for a lot of these drugs is very difficult you know i know i can't really metabolize drugs very well even antibiotics so you know i stay away from from them now but um you know really the the 
the battle I really want to fight is against benzos. I mean, the proof is there mm -hmm. that these. Hopefully really, it's coming, but just yeah. kind of like you, what you mentioned earlier about at any time, your doctor dies or retires, they stop taking your insurance. The hospital system decides we are not going to carry benzos anymore because we're seeing harm. A state creates a law. SAMHSA comes out with their new guidelines in 2025. It's in our best interest to do a patient directed taper under a, a knowledgeable medical professional. You know, because yeah. to me, I like me, I didn't see it coming. I was cold turkey in a hospital. <laughs> like I was actually tapering, but they didn't let me get down far enough, you know. But anyway, it's, so barbaric. Ugh, it's just I mean, everywhere. It's, and it's, yeah, it's just, yeah, it, it, it bothers me a lot. I try not to think about it because if I think about it too much, I just get really upset. And I think of all the avenues of advocacy I could be doing instead of helping individuals. And I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't do everything. I can't, you know, this is just, it's so pervasive and everywhere. But anyway, all it right. is. No, I, I get it, Angie. I get it. And you're doing, so you're doing so oh, much. I'm, I'm doing plenty. It's fine. I'm done. <laughs> but <laughs> for me, like, you know, I, that's why I wrote the book. It's like, this is, this is like my love letter to, yeah. to like the benzo withdrawal community or the bind community. Mm -hmm. And also to the people that helped me. Cause you know, and it wasn't just like the benzo tribe that helped me. Like, and this is where I'm really going to start crying. Like a lot of my friends believe me and I was really lucky. I mean, I, I just, you know, this is another one of those gifts in the shit storm is that, you know, uh, there were some wonderful people along the way that really got it. They, um, they believed me. Yeah. And I think that's like the number one thing that people going through this experience need is just, please believe us like that. This is real. Please please give us that dignity and that respect. Please read the stuff we give you to read that like, we're not the only, you know, this is like a phenomenon that's happening to thousands of people around the world. These drugs are so dangerous and they're so hard to withdraw from and discontinue. So please just believe us and please like, you know, please don't make it worse by gaslighting us and, right. you know, um, yeah. but yeah, a lot, a lot of my friends were so good about it. And um, there was a woman from my church who would like take me up for coffee. And I was like, you don't know me that well. Why are you doing this? And she's like, cause you're suffering so much. Oh my God. how beautiful! And like, that's like the true meaning of Christian love, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and, and it just was so wonderful to, you know, like you were saying, like people having that appointment, like having something to do with another person a caring person is so healing, you know, just getting a text from a friend, like, how are you doing? How's your taper going or whatever. And it makes you just realize how you want to pay that forward, you know, in your own life, once you're healed. Yeah. Yeah. Kindness always. Okay. Well, that's an emotional conversation. <laughs> That's I know Angie. more emotional than I thought, but it's yeah, because we know each other. We have that history. We have that shared yeah, experience. Yeah. I remember those suffering days and look how far we've come and how long it's took us. But, you know, we don't talk every day like we used to things like that. It's probably been a year since I talked to you. I don't there's, know. It's been yeah, a while. but there's like a bond, you know, that, that you have. It's like you've gone through this war together, you know, and, and not that I, you know, I don't want to minimize what you went through in a war, but it's no. like a, ba it is a battle. Like you oh, have to be yes. a warrior and you have to fight, Yes. you know? Um, and, but once you go through it, it's like, I feel like now, like I can get through pretty much anything, anything like, you know, when <laughs> people, agree. some of the stuff people complain about and I'm like, Oh man, you know, <laughs> I, I know I, I flew from Maine last week and we got there early and then they let us sit on the tarmac for like an hour and a half and everybody was so mad. And I was like, what are you mad about? Like, who cares? You're fine. Like it's, we're safe. You're just sitting here, hang out, chill, you know, everybody yeah, was so upset. Right. I was like, okay. I mean, we have drinks, we have a bathroom. What's wrong? What's the problem? I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. You're not, you're not, you're not going to die. Like, no. Yeah, we're, we're safe on the ground. Okay, so I always like to end with hope, and I did not yeah, put that in yeah. there on purpose, so you could not prepare for it. But uh, yeah, <laughs> what yeah, kind yeah. of hope can you leave for our audience? And remember, the audience is people that are tapering, people that are in the middle of acute withdrawal, people that are protracted, and all the in between caregivers. Would you, what would you leave them with today? Hopeful. 
just that it it feels like this experience okay i'm gonna cry but it feels like this experience is that you won't be able to survive it but you can and many of us have and you know don't go through it alone um you can play an active role in your own survival by developing some kind of toolbox i'm not talking about going out and you know learning how to you know play an instrument on a virtuoso level or something i'm talking about getting dressed you know, going from the bed to the television set, if you need to watch trashy TV, whatever, but do something, take a shower, do something to make yourself feel better. Reach out to somebody, you know, form Benzo Buddies. You you can survive this. Um, and it, when you're on the other side of it, 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 you will get your life back. Plus some. Plus some, right. Because everything is like technicolor. Like yeah. your life is so much better because of what you went through. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you appreciate the simple things, everything. You appreciate everything so much more. Yep. That's it. Well, thank you, Miss Allen. Thank you so much for your heart, for your thank editing, you, for your book, for your love letter mm -hmm. to the Benzo community. I'll put it, uh, Jill is in the comments. So she should put it down below if you'd like to get a copy. It's so inexpensive and it's it's like a warm a warm hug oh thank it you so much I read it. it felt like a hug it was beautiful all right oh, so thank, thank you so you. much angie thank you so much everybody thank you for watching next week i have a special guest from the anxious truth podcast his name is drew linsalata and i highly recommend you go listen to episodes one through ten on his podcast so that you have a question to ask him next week he also went through antidepressant withdrawal so he will be next friday and I have a whole bunch more coming. I'll put them. They'll be posted soon. But anyway, thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Helen. You're welcome. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. All right. Have a good one. Bye, Angie. Thanks. Bye.